sequence of DNA. That sequence of DNA is responsible for encoding a protein. Something that we should remember that the sequence DNA, we've got A's and C's and C's and G's. That's all we have. My example is the gene SILF. This is the gene that harbors the mutation that causes neural, yes? And SILF encodes a, a fiber, and this fiber is important for pigmentation. Okay. An allele, remember this is an alternate form of the gene. So we all have the same genes. We all have two copies, one from mom, one from dad. But we don't all have the same versions. There are slight variations. These are alleles. Genotypes. Um, these are the combination of alleles that the dog possesses. So like for Merle, we've got the little M is wild type. We've got big M is the Merle allele. Your genotype then could be little M, little M, or big M, big M. Those would be homozygotes because they have two of the same version, right? So you could have big M, little M. That would be a heterozygote. We have two different versions. Uh, and finally, we have phys uh, phenotype, which is the physical characteristic that results from whatever genotype we have. So a little M, little M dog is a tricolor solid, or a big M, little M dog is a merle. Okay? You're all with me. Okay. Now, just in case high school biology was a really long time ago for you, <laughs> we're going to revisit the central dogma. Oh, I have it. I forgot I have it. Okay. All this is. We have our, our DNA sequence, our gene, and um, it has a pathway a mechanism that it follows to turn it into a protein. That's all it is. So we have a gene, and we make some modifications, and we turn it into RNA, and RNA then gives like the, the code for translating it into a protein. This is a mechanism we're going to talk about a couple times today. Okay. There is another mechanism uh, and that's replication. Replication is if you want your cell to divide, your new cell is going to need a copy of the DNA as well. So you have to replicate it. So you replicate a copy of your DNA and we divide and we have now two cells. This is also a mechanism we're going to talk about today. So, okay. The first thing uh, I want to tell you about is, ready? It's maxillary canine tooth mesia version. Oh. Um, which is not that complicated, but here it is. This is our canine tooth, maxillary is on top. Here's our canine tooth. It's supposed to point straight down, right? So this is correct, dentition. If you have a mesioversion, it just means that your tooth is rotated, um, as it is in this picture. These are Shetland sheepdogs. So this tooth points out like this, like a lance or a spear. And so we call it Lance Canine, because that's way better than the other name. Okay, so I'm going to call it Lance Canine. Look, Lance Canine is not a great thing. It causes ulceration in the mouth. It can cause periodontal disease. It can be uncomfortable for the dog because they can't even close their mouth properly. So ultimately, this tooth has to be extracted. And you all know that if you walk into a show ring and your dog has a crooked canine or no canine, then there's a problem, right? So. This is something um, that the Shetland Chief Dog Health Group approached me about studying. What's really fascinating is that we don't have this in college, do we? We don't have Lance Canines, and yet we have it in Chelsea's. Okay, so I undertook a genome wide association study. You know what this is. I taught you four years ago. I'm going to teach you again. Um, this is my, my approach of choice. So here's, here's all we're doing, is we're collecting two populations, in this case, a group of Shelties that has Lance canines, and the other population is a group of Shelties that does not have Lance canines. Now, we want these two populations to be exactly the same otherwise. So if I have Merles with Lance canine, I need Merles that don't have Lance canine. If I have Shelties from Europe with Lance Canine, you need Shelties from Europe that don't have Lance Canine. And I need to make sure that I don't have an abundance of relatives. So I really, ideally, nobody in the study shares grandparents. That's, that's how we design a GWAS. And the idea is this. These two populations are exactly the same, except for the tooth issue. And so, 
We go in, we take their DNAs, and we genotype thousands of molecular markers. They're called SNPs, it doesn't matter. They're single nucleotide polymorphisms, so it's like you have a, a single place in the genome where you could have an A or a C, or you could have a G or an A, it doesn't matter. And we genotype them for thousands of SNPs, and then we ask the question, is there an allele of any of those SNPs that's more common in this group with the Lance canine and less common in this group without the Lance canine? That's all we're asking. And we calculate a statistic to determine that, right? A p-value. And, okay, so when you're trying to look at thousands of data points at one time, um, it's easiest to put it in a plot. So this is, it's called a Manhattan plot. Um, each little dot, see these little dots here? Each little dot represents one of those markers. Its position on the Y axis um, tells you how significant that p-value is. So the higher it is, uh, the more significantly associated it is with your, your phenotype. And this black line here is sort of like our line of, our, of thresh, it's like our threshold. Anything above that line says we got something. And then its position on the x-axis is just uh, where it is in the genome. So these are the chromosomes. Dogs have 38 chromosomes and an X and a Y that we don't care about. So if you look at this plot, I hope you can see, we have this lovely string of markers that are reaching and ultimately crossing the significant line there. And so what this tells me is that, hey, I should look at this part of chromosome nine. Now I have candidate genes that might harbor a mutation that causes Lance Canine, okay? Um, so what we did was we looked at that region and we said, well, since only Shelties get Lance Canine, only Shelties should have the mutation. And so we looked at this region compared to every other dog breed, and there, were no, there was nothing unique. Ooh, okay, that's not surprising because this is probably a complex disorder. So here's where the colleagues came in. This is, a, this is called a cladogram. It basically takes all the markers and it shows you how all the breeds are related to each other. Um, and so if you can see here in red, no surprise to any of us, collies and shelties are the, the nearest relatives in the world of dog breeds, yes? And collies don't have lance canines and shelties do. And so I said, okay, I'm going to look at all the variants that exist in shelties, but not collies in this region of chromosome nine. And I found two. And um, so these are, uh, one was, a, was an insertion and one was just a base change. Um, one is in a gene called growth hormone one. Ooh, that's interesting. One is in this other gene with this strange name, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I went back to the Shelties, I genotyped over 200 Shelties and, and it's very highly associated. So uh, look how small this number is to the minus 16. So very, very associated with Lance K9. Okay, um, so, I'm showing you here, this is like a cartoon of what growth hormone the gene looks like. Um, so these are exons, these little boxes. These are introns. Basically exons have all the important information and when you're doing that central dogma and you're processing it from DNA to RNA to protein, you cut out all these middle regions. And so you splice, we call it splicing. We splice one to two, we splice two to three, we splice three to four and so forth. So. If um, you have a mutation right here um, in humans of growth hormone, you um, uh, actually have pituitary dwarfism. And what happens is, is it causes loss of recognition of this. So you splice from one to two to four to five. And now when that code goes to make a protein, ugh, it's wrong, we're missing a chunk. We're missing a chunk of the, of the code and it's wrong. And um, this particular gene, Hormone is a hormone that's released in the very first step of basically cell proliferation, body growth. And, um, oh, here we go. Mutations cause, yep, pituitary dwarfism in humans. So our mutation was in that exact position. And I thought, ooh, that's weird. You know, you know what? Nobody ever said, hey, Leanne, it's the small shelfies. But it's growth hormone. And so I had to go back to everybody in that study and say, oh, please, could you weigh your dog and, and measure your dog up against the wall for me? Um, so we recollected all the information and oh my gosh, look what we found. 
These are affected dogs here. These are the controls and look at the height average. Fif over 15 inches for the, for the controls and just under 14 for the affected, which is a very significant p-value. And look at weight, big difference in weight, just over 15 pounds versus like 23 on average. And so, ooh, it is size and nobody noticed. It's the smaller dogs. Um, so then we looked and said, well, who else has these mutations? And we looked across over a thousand dogs, two other breeds, and we found it in 10 other breeds, and they're all toys. It doesn't exist in anything bigger than a Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, Ooh, except a Shelby. <laughs> and so think about what's probably going on here, right? Once upon a time, somebody brought this allele in because what's it going to do? It's going to make my dog smaller. We want a smaller dog. And the consequence of bringing that allele in is, uh, now my teeth don't fit in my jaw quite right. And that canine tooth has the, lar the longest root, so it's the one that kind of gets jacked up. And, oh, get this, in our study, we can attribute each each deleterious allele removes five pounds in weight off the dog's average, and each deleterious allele removes one inch in height. And so it's just it, it's just an interesting thing that I want you to think about because we wanted to select for small Shelfies, but a lot of times we bring in something we don't mean to bring in, or it's not compatible with the other alleles we have. These guys don't have crooked teeth, but they're already really small, right? So um, that's what I want you to think about here. Uh, well, I know, aren't they That's only, this was this guy I think is 14 and he's like 16. That's only a two inch difference. Um, okay, so moving on, no time to stop. Next, I'm going to talk to you about congenital idiopathic megaesophagus. Who's heard of megaesophagus? Yeah, everybody, I like that. So congenital megaesophagus just means present at birth. So these dogs, some breeders who get it a lot, they can pick it out at two days of age. Um, most of them, it's when they lean onto solid food, uh, about four weeks. Uh, idiopathic just means there's nothing really obvious that's causing it. Like we don't know why you have megaesophagus. Um, and so what this is, is essentially in your esophagus, you have these peristaltic activity that pushes food through your esophagus into your stomach. This is really important in dogs because think about how their esophagus is oriented. Our esophagus is straight up and down, so we get the benefit of gravity. But a dog's is horizontal, and they actually have to propel their food into their stomach. So if you have a defect in peristalsis, you're gonna know it. So what happens is that food hangs out in the esophagus, doesn't make it to the stomach, and then it like, ooh, the longer it sits there, it stretches on the fat tubes, now it stretches out the esophagus and it's even less effective at moving food in. And if they get up and run around, they regurgitate the food in, and that's the end of that. So these dogs um, have to be held upright. That's really the best treatment they have. So Jake here is sitting in the bucket after his meal. They hold them upright for like 25 minutes. Um, they have a general failure to thrive. I mean, look at this guy. He's, he didn't make it. Um, they just, it's really tough to get that food in. So now, to know for sure if your dog has megaesophagus, it's just a simple radiograph. You can do a standard radiograph. These are barium swallows. So they're, these are five week old German Shepherds. Um, they give them a, a barium meal and then they do this image like uh, 40 some minutes later. Um, and so on the top, we have an affected dog. And can you see how the barium is like all over this esophagus? And look, what, what is that? It's all stretched out. Very little barium made it through the stomach and into the intestines. Whereas on the bottom, we have a healthy dog. So a real narrow tube, all the food has moved on into the intestine. So that's how you diagnose it. A lot of dogs get euthanized if they can't treat it, putting them upright. Um, megaesophagus, I, I think it's found in every breed. Like I can't think of any breeds I haven't heard about. Um, but if you look at all the dogs that are diagnosed with megaesophagus, German Shepherds lead the way. Like, so there was a recent study in the last um, few years, 28% of cases in the US were German Shepherds. Like, that's huge. Um, there's other breeds that seem to be predisposed. Labradors, Danes, uh, Dachshunds, and Indonesian. Also have, these are 2% higher, kind of 
higher frequency. Um, and so when you see that, when you have something that occurs more frequently in one breed than the other, like ding, 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 that, I mean, that's like inheritable contributing to that. Um, and so we set out to find uh, what was causing this in German Shepherds. And the very first thing we noticed was that we collected a whole lot more males than females. Um, now, our study wasn't quite significant, but we worked with another group that has a private colony of German Shepherds, and they radiograph all of their puppies at five weeks of age, and they had 20 years of data, and they had two-thirds of cases were males. What we think is happening here, females have estrogen. Even in utero, the puppy has estrogen. Estrogen relaxes smooth muscle. There's a sphincter that connects the esophagus to the stomach that is made of smooth muscle. And so what we think is happening is that having that estrogen and allowing that sphincter to relax a little bit more allows more of that food to move through. Males just don't have this like advantage, if that makes sense. Um, so we did a GWAS. I don't even have to circle this in red, do I? <laughs> look, oh, where should I look? I think here on chromosome 12. Um, so this was just with 59 cases and 53 controls. And I'll tell you, this isn't the only thing that's causing megaesophagus. We don't even know technically if it's causing megaesophagus, but it's the thing that I can map. So it's the thing that's variable in the population that maybe they can do something about. Um, and so we did. We went in and looked at chromosome 12 there, and um, we found there's gene there called melanin concentrating hormone receptor 2. Oh, it sounds awful. But it's, it's a receptor for a hormone. This hormone is a neurotransmitter, so it comes from the brain. Um, and it comes from the part of the brain that um, controls reward, um, food motivation, appetite. Um, and I look at these studies in mice. If you take this hormone and you decrease it in mice, um, the mouse, it, he isn't as hungry. And so he's skinnier than his, his counterpart here. Um, and if you increase it in mice, ooh, I'm so hungry all the time. Um, and I'm fatter than my buddy. And so that's what this hormone does. Um, and now this area we found is the receptor, which should have something to do with sort of interpreting the hormone. Um, and so we think, we did find a, a risk allele here, and we think that it's all maybe tied to food motivation. So especially working dogs, people breed for food motivation, like think about German Shepherds and Labradors. Um, a lot of groups find the dogs easier to train if they're food motivated. So maybe this allele um, is impacting gastrointestinal motility. So think about food moving through your system. If the food moves through real slowly, then you, you feel full longer and you're not as hungry. But if the food moves through faster, then you feel hungry faster, faster and you're much more food motivated. Um, and so future projects, um, We'll include looking at this in other breeds. So does dark blue allele represents this brisk allele here? Um, one of the things we found is that, so German Shepherds just have a ton of it naturally in their population, um, but also do all the other breeds that were um, that have higher incidences of mega. So we want to look and see if this allele is indeed associated with mega in those breeds. You're all thinking about collies. There's three alleles of this particular locus. It's, um, it's sort of a, a repeat. Um, collies have, like 80% of collies have like the wild type allele. Um, they do have the risk allele. Um, and then there's a third allele that we think might actually be protective. Like they might work in the collies don't have that allele. So we can look. Um, the other thing that I really want to look into is gastrointestinal motility probably underlies some other things. I don't know if anybody out there is thinking of uh, bloat. Um, but there's a lot of people that say, you know, food in the stomach, if it sits there longer, then that gives you more opportunity um, for a tumor to occur. And so that would be an interesting thing to look at as well. Okay, we're gonna, gonna keep going. Epilepsy. Uh, here we go. It's the most common neurological disorder of all dogs. And I think the <coughs> estimated incidence across breed is like 0.75%. Um, Basically, you can have seizures for a lot of reasons, um, but there's a lot of breeds that have seizures for no apparent reason. Um, so we don't have any sort of metabolic imbalance. We don't have some sort of abnormal brain structure. Um, and so we call that idiopathic, just like the magnesophagus. Like, we don't know why you have seizures. Um, 
There have been a few studies where they have identified genes that underlie really very specific types of seizures. Um, and then there have been a handful of studies for idiopathic epilepsy and other graded cells, like any of them that include the colonies. Mm, and they find some suggestive uh, associations. There's one uh, locus that they, they seem to be pretty confident about involved in shepherds. Does it explain everything? No. Um, and I'm gonna argue that this is going to be one of those diseases where probably every breed has its own little set of risk alleles that are contributing and causing this. It's not going to be something. Um, so for the purpose of our study, um, at this point we've de defined epilepsy as repeated seizures over time. Um, so any dog that has had repeated seizures over time is eligible. Uh, to date, we've been working on this two years I think now, we've collected 51 epileptic colleagues, um, 37 dogs that we consider controls, which means they're like eight or nine or older, um, and they've never had a seizure. Um, we've obtained some samples from Chick, we've got 11 cases and some more controls. Um, and don't forget, we have a whole bunch of dermatomyositis data um, that are always there for us. Um, we didn't have any epileptic colleagues in the study, but we had 36 dogs that qualify for, um, to be controls. Um, and so ultimately, we were able to conduct a GWAS with 27 cases and 53 controls. And you think, ooh, that's like a much smaller number, but remember I taught you how we have to do a GWAS. It has to be balanced, I mean, they have to be two populations that are perfectly identical in every single way, except these guys have seizures and these guys don't. And so even though we collected all those dogs, they don't all fit sort of in one of those groups, if that makes sense. Um, because I'm me, I always collect more than I need. I went for Shelties too. So we've collected 32 Shelties and 30, uh, with epilepsy and 33 controls. Uh, we didn't even ask Chick for this. Um, and we have 108 from the dermatomyositis studies. And so technically for a GWAS, we have uh, 20 cases and 113. Um, so here's what we did. This is our preliminary GWAS with 27 cases and 53 controls. Ooh. Okay, so we got this guy all done, and he's trying real hard to get to that line. Um, this is, it's a smallish subset, and we have, I really wouldn't want any more controls. We really need to add more cases to that and try to get that so that we can see that allele frequency difference, right? We have to have, be able to see the difference. So we really need more, really need more cases. Um, and so I did think, ooh, well, let's, let's add in the shelfies and see, ooh, okay. So we can add in the shelfies, and we can, we can make that guy go over the line of significance. It's interesting, it's promising. That's more shelfies than I wanna have in the study. So we really, really need, um, really need to increase the size of our GWAS. That's like, that's our major thing. We have to, we have to be 100% certain that we have significance there, or we could go on a, we could go down the rabbit hole on a wild goose chase. Um, so, Right now, more than anything, oh please, I need more samples of epileptic colleagues um, to get that GWAS size. I really, I really would like to double it, ideally. Um, in the meantime, or simultaneously, we're going to be working on sequencing the genomes of several colleagues that have epilepsy. So we'll pick several diverse, genetically diverse colleagues, and then we can go in and we can start looking at the genes in that region. There is an interesting, very interesting gene in that region that one day I might be telling you about. Um, so we want to go in and we want to look at that gene, we want to see what variants are there, we want to know if those variants might be damaging or not. Um, and so that's where we are with the GWAS. We're going to keep going. Okay, how are we doing? Oh, great. So, so we're going to talk about mouth. Okay. Can you probably speak a little louder? I can. Okay, thank you. I will. Um, okay, let's talk about Merle. First thing I want to remind you is neural is a pattern, right? So you have one color gene at play in colleagues with an allele that makes for black and an allele that makes for sable. Um, and then you have two patterning genes. You've got the, the color red white, um, and you've got Merle. And these, are, these genes decide, you know, where do I have color and how much color do I have there? Just not what color is there, but that's the other thing. Okay. Um, ah. Merle is dominant. You know that. Uh, but that's why it's denoted by a capital M. So the capital letter indicates that it's a dominant allele. And so then this is the recessive allele. Um, so, or in our case, it's also the wild type allele. So this is the sort of the original. Um, and so 
Okay, when you think about dominance, like a very simple dominant would work like this. As long as you had one copy of that dominant big M allele, then you would be a moral dog, and they would all be the same otherwise. Um, and then having no copies means I'm a solid color dog. Um, but you know that that's not how this works, right? So it's not simple. So it's right off the bat, it's not simple. So Merle is, is a semi-dominant, which means that there's like this intermediate phenotype, uh, which is the one that we want, right? Um, and if you have two copies of Merle, then uh, as you well know, you're a double Merle. Maybe you have auditory and ocular defects, maybe you don't. Um, listen, today, it's all about the heterozygous Merles. So all of the images I'm going to show you from here on out are single Merles. They're all genotyped, they're big M, they're little M, okay? So we're not talking about double Merles. Don't even think about double Merles anymore, okay? I want you to think about standard Merles. This is my Merle collar, this is Dr. Watson. <laughs> Dr. Watson is a standard Merle. Now, when you think about Merle, you think, okay, here's the phenotype. I have a dilute background and I have patches of full pigmentation. And that's the phenotype. Right now, and from here forth, I want you to think about Merle as two phenotypes. That's what it is. It's two phenotypes and it's controlled by two mechanisms, okay? So one of your phenotypes is I have a dilute base coat, okay? The second phenotype is I have patches of full pigmentation. They are two separate things. They, they are caused by independent mechanisms. They all come back to the same thing, but they work differently, okay? So we're gonna think about them in this way from now on. Okay, ah, so let's talk about some variations of Merle that I'm sure some of you have seen. Um, I call this dilute. That's what it is. So this is, this is a, a, it looks like a solid dilute dog. Don't you look at it and you think about like, the, there's an MLPH is a gene that has, has a, a dilute allele, causes dilute in like Dobermans and Great Danes and, and Chows. I think about that, that's what it looks like. That's not what it is. Um, we genotyped all the dogs in our study. They do not have any mutations in that gene. These, this is a phenotype that is a variation of neural. I'm trying to think of what else people called it. Maltese, I think it's mm -hmm. called, right? Yes. Okay, Maltese. But, I mean, what do you see? I look at this and I see a dog that's got dilute fur. It's not black. But you know what? It's also not as light as Dr. Watson's fur. Isn't that interesting? It, there seems to be a little more pigment there. So it's lighter. And where are that dog's spots? They're not there. It's a very solid, a solid dilute. Um, dilute comes out of nowhere. So you breed a standard Merle to a, a tricolor and you, what, what is this? You, you get this, this dilute dog and a lot of people, of course, in, in the collie world think, oh my gosh, it's great collie syndrome. No, if, if you have a Merle parent, maybe even if you don't have a Merle parent, I need you to think this first. The, the more likely answer is you have a dilute Merle. Okay, it's not, it's not sickly neutropenia. Um, okay, Harlequin, another variation of Merle. Call it Harlequin, this is what it's called in Great Danes. You know, you can picture the Harlequin Great Dane with the white coat and the big black patches. Uh, years ago, um, I found the mutation that causes that. It's a separate gene. So Harlequin Great Danes, they're heterozygous Merles, and they're heterozygous for a mutation in another gene. So it's a biallelic, that is not what's happening here, okay? 99% um, of colleagues that look like this, it's, it's a variation of Merle, okay? This dog is quite severe, like she's very dramatic, like I'm white and I have black patches. Um, but the, there's like a, kind of a whole spectrum. So you can see the Sheltie, like at first glance, it really kind of looks like a Merle Sheltie. Um, but you can see there's a lot of white in here and then this face, this is not a white factor dog, that's Harlequin. Um, that's altering that, that, um, that pattern on the face. Um, so there's like, there's sort of a spectrum. It's, it's very much a spectrum you're going to see. Um, and just like dilute, all the point comes out of nowhere. So you bring a standard to a, a tricolor and you, you get this white dog and everybody immediately thinks, oh my God, it's a double girl. <sighs> you can look at this puppy and you can see patches of full pigment, right? That's your first clue. It's not a double girl. Okay, um, these, right, in a double Merle, these would be patches of Merle, probably. Um, so, deep breath, don't panic. Um, but it, it happens to everybody. Oopsie. Um, and then the last variation of Merle you all know is cryptic Merle. 
we've known about cryptic rules for forever, right? So you, you named them cryptic rules because either a double merle produced a solid color dog, how's that work? Or maybe two solid color dogs produced a merle or um, you had this unexpected merle. And so then you know, uh-oh, one of my solids must actually have that big in the meal, but oh, so weird, they don't have the phenotype. Okay, so, um, so that's the third variation. Uh, okay, so 2006, a long time ago, um, back right after I first met with Robert and Steve in Boise, um, I discovered the insertion that an insertion in this gene called SIL um, is what causes moral. Um, and so this insertion is about 300 base pairs. So like this is a fragment that says it should be 200 base pairs. And look at this moral dog, it's got this band at 500 base pairs. That's because there's 300 bases of extra sequence in that dog's Merle gene, that SIL gene. There's extra sequence there. It's an insertion, 300 base pairs. Okay. Um, here's what that insertion is. I couldn't make this stuff up. It's jumping DNA. That's kind of what we, we call it for fun. It has a real name, I'm not gonna tell you. Um, but it's jumping DNA. And so it has this ability, it's a sequence in the genome, right? It has this ability to copy itself and then insert itself somewhere else, right? So if this is a stretch of DNA and this is the jumping DNA, it can copy itself and insert itself somewhere else. And if this happens in the germline, you know, from where the, the egg and the sperm come from, then guess what? The puppy now has the original location and a new location. And now this one can copy itself and this one can still copy itself and put itself somewhere else, it's happening. And the mutation, the exact piece of jumping DNA that causes Merle makes up 7% of the dog genome, 7%. And that number is only going to get bigger because it continues to copy itself and paste itself everywhere. So most of the time it pastes itself somewhere where it's like, we don't care, it doesn't matter. Um, but in our case, Ooh, it pasted itself in the SIL gene. And so this is a cartoon of the SIL gene, maybe. I don't know if you can see it. All it is is it's 11 exons. I've already taught you these exons get spliced together, right? So while we're trying to make a protein, we've got to take out those middle sequences and we splice one to two to three to four and so forth to 11, okay? This jumping gene bounced right on in there, right at the boundary of exon 11. And what happens is when we're trying to splice from 10 to 11, it kind of messes us up and we get a little confused. And so we splice instead to this jumping DNA and then we go into 11. So now it goes 9, 10, jumping DNA, 11. Okay, so we'll see how that, what happens to that. Ah, so here's, here's my reminder. We have a gene. We're going to process it into RNA and cut out those lines that we don't need and put the boxes together. And then we're gonna use that as a, as a we're gonna translate that into a protein. Okay, so if you have a regular Merle allele, we splice them all together and we make a regular protein. I arbitrarily chose a triangle. It's, here's, this is our regular protein, folds up, looks like a triangle like this. That's not true, but um, this is regular. That's all we make. But if you have the, the Merle allele, and we have our piece of jumping DNA sitting there, then uh, we mess up. Uh, they come in together, that's fine. So instead we make this big mess, right? Because now I'm making this protein and I've got this extra sequence there. Who knows what it's coding for? And so it's just like the protein is just a mess. And this is important. When you have a protein that isn't right, your body knows and it tags it and says, you're not right and it sends it to the recycling center. And it goes into the recycling center, it cuts it up in little pieces and recycles the pieces. We'll use it for something else. But, it, but that's important, um, that you're able to get rid of that protein. Like, otherwise it builds up. So you have to get rid of that protein. Here's what I'm gonna teach you today, which is kind of the big thing we found out in, when we published this. And that is that when you make that protein, or when you're making that decision, um, sometimes you make it right and sometimes you make it wrong. So this Merle allele, you know, you have two copies. We have a little M, it's always making, right? And then we have a big M. And what I'm telling you is that sometimes 
we splice incorrectly, and sometimes we do it right. So we've got good protein and bad protein coming from that allele. And that's really the, the heart of where our variation is, how much good protein are we making. So here's what you need to know about what our protein is from Merle. Merle, uh, this gene, SILF, is only expressed in melanocytes. That's really key. Um, so it's not expressed in your brain or your heart or your pancreas, nowhere else, only in melanocytes. And these are specialized cells that are in your skin. And they contain the pigment that gives your skin color. Okay, that's all the cell does. Well, that's mainly what the cell does. Um, so this green blob here is the melanocytes, and then in it um, are these little granules of melanin. They give the color. Okay. Um, Silv, that gene, makes a fiber. It's not really a triangle. So it makes a fiber, and those fibers come together and they form a net. And the melanin sits on the net. Okay. So in a normal dog, our melanin granules are sitting on our very nicely made net because I have two fully functional copies of this gene and both of them are making good protein and so my net looks really good and my dog looks black, okay? But if you have one Merle allele and so we're producing some non-functional or abnormal protein, then now as you see my net is like not really the greatest net and the melanin goes to sit on it and it doesn't hold at all. And so we really just don't have enough melanin to give the fur that black color. And that's why our fur is gray, okay? We just don't have enough melanin because our net is leaky. That's the basis, okay? So really, really what it all comes down to is how leaky is your net? It's <laughs> spectrum. So here we have a fully pigmented patch of fur and then we have like the dilute fur from the dog, from that dilute dog, standard Merle, all the way up to Harlequin where we really don't have any melanin at all. Um, and so it all comes down to this in allele, how much good protein and how much bad protein am I producing? Okay? Um, and, and it's a spectrum. So if my net's solid, I'm all black. And if my net sucks, I am white. And then there's everything in between, okay? Um, okay, so what determines this? What determines how much bad and how much good am I making? It's really all about the sequence of that jumping DNA. So this is, there's our jumping DNA. It has like that particular type of jumping DNA it has like the sequence, don't worry about it. At the end of it is this thing called a poly A tail. It's just a bunch of A's in a row. Our sign, our jumping DNA inserted backwards um, which makes these T's, because A's pairs with T, so anyway, it doesn't matter. We have a run of T's at the beginning. It looks like this. The T's go on forever. This is like extraordinarily long. So we have all these T's, and we have some unique sequence, not to worry, um, but these T's are what we're kind of all about. And um, so, when you have an exceptionally long number of T's in a row, it's very hard, it's very fragile. So you have a lot of opportunity for them to change, like the number of T's to change. Like you might gain some T's or you might lose some T's, if that makes sense. So um, yes, yeah. just gonna keep going. Okay. So here's what we did. We took Merle dogs of all breeds and took pictures, <coughs> looked at their phenotypes, and then I designed this assay to basically count how many T's are there, okay? It doesn't matter what the assay is, but here it's, it's this blue peak here. This peak tells me there's 80 T's. When we looked at 161 Merle dogs, we found that all of them, oops, all of them have 78 to 86 T's. Okay, and almost all of them have 79, 80, or 81. Almost all of them. So it's actually pretty reproducible. Um, the standard collie, by the way, has 79 T's. That seems to be the norm. Um, okay, so that's, that's their deal. When we looked at cryptic morals, we had 19 cryptic morals in our study, and they all had 25 to 55 T's. That's a lot less, yes? So we have a lot shorter of that tail of T's, okay. 
when we looked at dilute minerals, we had, um, let's see, 66 to 74 TeV. That's in between, right? So we have our standards, we had our, our cryptics, and now in between we have those dilutes. Um, we had 18 of those um, in our study. Oh, this is, I, I got to go meet this dog, um, and then I got to meet her brother. This is interesting, this is her brother. And their parent, they had one parent that looked just like him, and she was a complete surprise. <laughs> Um, but he has 80, so it's, it's an interesting observation that he had 80 T's and she had 72 T's. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, basically in her germline, she lost 8 T's. And 8 T's made that difference. 8. Um, okay, and last we had our Harlequin dogs. We had 41 Harlequin dogs. And they had, ooh, 81 to a whopping 105 T's in their tail. So they're on this side of the spectrum, okay? Um, so this is, this is Moose, um, and he kind of has an intermediate, and then this is the record holder, 105 T's, and look how crisp she's got. She is black and she is white. Um, very crisp um, in hers. Um, okay, so what I want you to understand what's happening is basically as we're increasing the number of T's, um, we're decreasing the amount of good protein we're producing. So the bigger that insertion is, the more we splice wrong, and the more we make the bad protein. And so here, it's short, we're making all good protein. Then once we hit 66, ooh, then we start, we start making some bad choices, and we start splicing wrong every now and then, and making some bad protein. When we get to 81, we're making even more. We make the wrong choice more often. More bad protein, leakier net, less melanin, lighter fur color. Yeah? And then when we get to 100, I mean, that's just crazy. And we're white, and you're, I hope you're sitting there thinking, but there's a regular Merle allele. Where's the melanin coming from the regular Merle allele? But at this point, we're so horribly big, we almost always, maybe always make the wrong decision, and then we produce a whole bunch of bad protein, and the cell can't handle it, and it kills the cell. It's just a melanocyte, it looks fine. Right? It's, it's, that, that, that's why this was important. It's only expressed in a melanocyte. It only kills a melanocyte. Everywhere where a dog has white, there's no melanocytes there. That's why it's white. There's nothing there to give it color. Right? Around the necks, there's no melanocytes there. Um, so we're killing the melanocytes. We have white fur. It's not a crisis, but that's what's happening. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to remind you one more time. Um, let me see. Yeah, okay. So. So this is our dogma. So this is what's happening with our dilute base color. We've got our gene, we're trying to make a good protein. We're messing up in between because of that giant insertion. We get dilute fur. That is not, however, what's causing spots. Spots are something else. And that is where replication comes in. So remember I said, when you wanna replicate a cell, we have to copy the DNA, we have to make a whole new copy, we have to give it to the new cell. So we make spots. Um, and we mess up during replication. So we're replicating our DNA. We've got all those darn T's in a row, we can't handle it, and we make mistakes. And what happens is, it'll just cut out part of those T's. This is too many T's for me. I'm gonna go back and take it down to like 50. Okay, so during replication, when the cell's dividing, when is the cell dividing a lot? Oh, when we're developing the puppy, right? In utero, the cells are dividing, and we're messing up those T's. Um, what's happening here? Okay, so there's a population of cells in the, the fetus there that, that it's called the neural crest. It runs right along the back, and the cells migrate from there, and they migrate, and the melanocytes are in there. The melanocytes migrate around the body, so they come around the back. Um, they come around to the belly, and as they're migrating, they're replicating. As they're replicating, they're messing up that darn T-tail and they're truncating it. Well, what happens if you truncate that T-tail down to 50? What's 50 mean? What? We're a cryptic dog. Basically now that cell, that cell can now produce, make the right choice. It produces good pigment or good net and then we can have pigment. So um, these split-faced dogs, right? That's 
you can tell. So the cells are coming around this way. The cell that this went this way on this guy, he went this way. He kept all 79 of his genes all the way through. This guy on his journey over, um, he dumped about 30 of his teas. And so now that particular cell can produce full pigment. And so this side is, is making, is a spot, right? Um, so when you look at a dog and you're seeing spots, you need to know that, ooh, okay, where I have that spot, I've lost a whole bunch of teas and I'm down there in the 40s or 50s. And I can, I can make good protein and I can make a good net and you can see my melanin. And, and then everywhere where the dog is still dilute is I maintained that 80 teas in a row and sometimes I make a bad choice and I don't have enough net. Okay, does that make sense? All right. Um, okay, this is called mosaicism. Happens all the time. So the dog inherited one length of T's, but as the cells are replicating this mutation, we're truncating these T's is happening in various cells. And so you've got cells with two different genotypes kind of, right? So some have, they have different numbers of T's in different cells. And you, um, and that really determines. Oh, one thing you need to know when you're, when you're testing for Merle, like if you were to test for it, you would take a cheek swab or maybe a blood sample. Those are somatic cells. Right, so those are the cells in our body. They're not really, they're not your germ cells, right? Your germ line, where you've got your sperm and your egg, are producing the next generation, and they they split off real early in development, and they have their own path. So they've taken their own path. So you can kind of guess what's happening on their path based on the length of the tail size that inherited, um, is inherited, but, but they have their own path. Um, okay, so what, what we learned is that if a dog has 74 or less T's, um, we don't, we replicate fine. We can copy our T tail up to 74 times, no problem. And we don't revert and we're fine. And so we're either, if we're cryptic, we're solid. And if we're a dilute, we're still making a bad choice with the protein. But as far as replication goes, no problem. I can, I can replicate that and I'm not gonna revert and I'm not gonna have a spot. Um, but once you hit like 78, for some reason, not less is too many teeth, I can't do it. Um, and so I'm gonna just truncate that tail, I'm gonna cut back to a cryptic length. That's the difference in four T's, is I can, from, from I can replicate it to I, I just can't. Um, and so um, what's kind of interesting is that you can kind of tell, like this guy, he's got a bunch of spots versus she's got 92 T's, she's got big spots. Really think this is, I, when I was developing and my cells were migrating, I, I made that mistake and I truncated earlier in the game and a bigger cell population came from that one. So I kind of think, and it's, it doesn't hold true all the time, but in general, the bigger the spots, the longer the, the tape the tea goes. Because it just, I just didn't make it that far. And so it's a bigger cell population versus little, a bunch of little ones. So again, this is the difference in four T's. Um, and then the last thing is these dogs, I call it an early reversion, that's that truncating of the, the T-tail. If it happens when the, the embryo is just a few cells big, then pretty much all the cells are going to have a shorter T-tail and are going to be able to produce normal protein and you end up with a solid looking dog. She actually inherited 105 T's, but early on in embryogenesis, eh, there was too many and it cut it back during replication. And, um, and so she really almost looks like a solid dog. You can just barely tell that she's a Harlequin. Um, same with this guy. You can just barely tell, very early reversion. Now, the thing I want you to learn from that um, is sometimes you can tell, uh, but the projector will turn off in three minutes, so I don't know if that's like my cue mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to wrap it up, but where John is, John. Um, but anyway, this dog, well, it's over right now, but right there, see his little merle patch? He is perfectly solid everywhere. He's got a little merle patch on his head, and that merle patch tells you that dog has a big M. And um, not only does he have a big M, but he had a big M. He inherited 70-90s. It's just he reverted early, early to 51. Um, and, it's, and so he's not cryptic, right? He's going to breed like a merle. Like his germline has 79s. So that's the thing, there's a difference. Uh, cryptics inherit the 51, right? But some dogs can revert when they inherit a normal amount. And I, just, I gotta touch on, 
they can lengthen. It's not the norm, it's the exception. We would much rather truncate, it's easier, but you can have some mistakes where you lengthen. Um, so this standard Merle dog produced this female puppy. Um, so he added nine T's to his ATL and that's what happened. So nine T's made the difference between those two. Um, and then here's a same thing. Um, she added five T's and look how Harlequin that puppy looks with just five extra T's. It makes a huge difference in what kind of protein you're producing. So, um, and we saw this six times in our study and five times it came from the male and that's not constant. Um, I think it's, it's a little, there's a little, maybe a little more mistake prone, um, <laughs> we'll say. Um, so, so in summary, I don't have a minute left. In summary, um, um, our base coat is we can't make, we're not making good protein and that starts happening once we get to 66 T's and we start sometimes splicing wrong and making bad protein. And that's your dilute base color. And then our spots are caused by cell replication. We start messing up at about 75. We start cutting it back to make it shorter at about 75. And that's when you start getting spots. So it all comes down to that detail and the length of that insertion sitting in silk, but it's two entirely different mechanisms. And that's really why we have so much variation with Merle. Um, and this is just an image, it's the same thing I just, you can see solid all the way down to very white background. And you can see that it gets bigger. As you add T's, our, we get less and less pigment and we get bigger and bigger spots as we add T's. So the longer it gets, the more mistakes you're gonna make in both pathways. In the end, um, so uh, this is my Dr. Watson. He has 79 T's, in case you were wondering. Um, and he's proud of it. Um, and yeah, this is my lab. I have three graduate students right now, two undergraduate students, and two very good friends that come and help me do my thinking because there's a whole lot of thinking that goes into this. <laughs> and um, I, the, the smarter the speaker is, the, the worse my head feels. Right now I have a headache after listening to Dr. Clark. But thank you for that very informative lecture. And you know, if this was her lecture and you only understood this much, you're about where I am right now. So that said, uh, I am Dr. Darren Collins. I'm the CEO of the other CHF, the Canine Health Foundation. So, uh, I want to thank the Kali Health Foundation for inviting me to be here, and especially Robette for inviting me to, to introduce myself and introduce my organization to all of you in the room. And I want to tell a story. I, I was at the ATC delegates meeting earlier this month, and I was sitting with delegates, and we were having lunch. I was sitting with a Bashan, person, a standard schnauzer person, a Sheltie person, and a Saluki person. And I'm a Saluki person, that's why I was at this table. And we were talking about skulls, and teeth, and dentition, and what makes a good judge? And how do you understand what you're seeing with your eyes? How does that inform you about what's beneath all of that? And I said, I just threw it out there, does anybody know about a breed club, parent club, that possibly has a skull collection. There's so much variation in skulls. And what goes with a skull are the teeth. And I was a clinical veterinarian before I became a zoo veterinarian, and I looked in the mouths of all these different species, and you think, you assume, maybe I did, that little dogs, Leanne was talking about little dogs, the, ever look inside of a pug's mouth? I'm telling you, the teeth go in every which way direction if there's teeth there. And they look beyond that, okay? But all of this is together. So I um, got an email from the shelf person I was having lunch at, and they said, you wouldn't believe what just happened. I was at the Sheltie National, and there was this lady there, and she had all these skulls. 
and she was telling us about schools and how they form and how a school matures and where the teeth are in the skull. And this was to educate people who were at the uh, show. And the woman who brought the schools is in the room, Brenda, and she is a member of your parent club. You guys have so much to brag about. You really do. You were formed a long, long time ago as a health foundation to really get down and answer some of the questions. Your job is not to do the research that Leanne does. Your job is to come up with the research questions and to fund it. Funding it is the hardest part. And because of people like you who are sitting in this room and you're just starving, I know I'm keeping you from your dinner. So the, the funding is really, really critical. And I also want to thank you for partnering with us because what we help you do is spend your money, okay? <laughs> and we help you find people like Dr. Clark to do the research to answer the questions that you guys are coming up as breeders, as judges, as exhibitors, and as pet owners, collie pet owners. The worst thing you wanna do is send a puppy home and have the owner call you back and say, my dog's been diagnosed with this problem. What are you gonna do about it? You guys know at this point, for the most part, what you have to deal with as a breed club. And you know the problems, and hopefully you're doing your due diligence to find the answers. And the Blue Merle question is really interesting to solve, but also the other conditions like epilepsy. That, I mean, that is such a frustrating problem to have in a dog breed. And bloat. And um, pyometra. And immune problems, lymphoma. Collies and lymphoma, I've heard it today. I got here today, I'm here through the weekend as well. But lymphoma is not just a collie issue, it's a dog issue. And Canine Health Foundation is about dogs. You guys go to dog shows with your collies and you hang out with collie people and you go to the collie ring and you may or may not stay for groups to watch the collie, but you're in a herding group. Your collies are related to other breeds. Leanne talked about that. So if you're curious, and I know you are, and that's the best thing to be is to be curious to try and find the answers to these issues some have been around for a while and others are new problems cropping up so stay curious stay involved support your organization and I want to thank you for helping us do what we do to help you because we can do it together better than we can do it alone and we're really doing it for the dogs so I'm here through Saturday. I want you to find me. I want you to tell me your worst collie health problems. I love hearing about it. You're making me better at what I do in my position to inform me. So help me help you. I'm really happy to be here. Congratulations on, I don't know what specialty it is, but um, you have a huge legacy with your breed and you have that responsibility to be stewards of your breed for the future. There's a lot of gray hairs in this room, myself included, but you know, embrace the young generation coming up because they're following your lead. And so thank you again, and I'm gonna turn the mic